Josh forced his eyes open. Black spots danced in front of him, and when he raised his hand to his face, he could see the ghost of his own golden aura still visible around his flesh. Reaching out, he found his sister's hand and caught it. He, she squeezed gently, and he turned to find her blink in her eyes open. What happened? He mumbled, too shocked and numb to even be scared. Sophie shook her head. It was like an explosion. I heard Scat that scream, he added. And I thought I saw someone coming out of the house. They both turned back to the townhouse. Skatach was at the door, her arms wrapped around a young woman, holding her tightly, swinging her arm in a circle. Both women were laughing and squealing with delight, shouting at one another in rapid French. I guess they know each other, Josh said as he helped his sister to her feet. The twins turned to look at the Comte de Saint Germain, who was standing to one side, arms folded across his chest, smiling delightedly. They're old friends, he explained. They've not met in a long time, a very long time. Jermaine coughed. <laughs> Joan, he said politely. The two women broke apart and the woman he had called Joan turned to look at St. Germain, her head tilted at a quizzical angle. It was impossible to guess her age. Dressed in jeans and a white t-shirt, she was Sophie's height, almost unnaturally slender, her inner deeply tanned and flawless skin emphasized huge gray eyes. Her auburn hair was cut in a short boyish style. There were tears on her cheeks as she brushed away with the quick movement of her palm. Francis? she asked. And these are our visitors. Holding Skatech's hand, the young woman stepped closer to Sophie. As the woman approached, Sophie felt sudden pressure in the air between them, as if some invisible force was pushing her back, and then, abruptly, her aura flared silver around her, and the air was filled with a sweet aroma of vanilla. Josh grabbed his sister's arm, and his own aura crackled a light, adding to the scent of oranges to the air. Sophie? Josh? St. Germain began. The rich, sweet aroma of lavender filled the courtyard as a hissing silver aura grew around the short-haired young woman. It hardened and solidified, becoming metallic and reflective, molding itself into a breastplate and greaves, gloves and boots, before it finally solidifying into a complete medieval suit of armor. I would like to introduce my wife, Joan. Your wife! Scatty squealed, shocked. Whom you and history know as Joan of Arc. Breakfast had been laid out on a long, polished wooden table in the kitchen. The air was rich with the odor of newly baked bread and brewing coffee. Plates were piled high with French fruit, pancakes, and scones, while sausages and eggs sizzled in a pan on the old-fashioned iron range. Josh's stomach started rumbling the moment he had stepped into the room and saw the food. His mouth filled with saliva, reminding him just how long it had been since he had last eaten. He'd only managed a couple of sips of the hot chocolate at the cafe earlier before the police arrived. Eat, eat, St. Germain said, grabbing a plate in one hand and a thick croissant in the other. He bit into the pastry, spilling wafer-thin flakes onto the tiled floor. You must be famished. Sophie leaned in close to her brother. Could you get me something to eat? I want to talk to Joan. I need to ask her something. Josh glanced quickly at the young-looking woman who was pulling cups from the dishwasher. Her short haircut made it impossible to guess her age. Do you really think she's good Joan of Arc? Sophie squeezed her brother's arm. After all we've seen, what do you think? She nodded toward the table. I just want fruit and cereal. No sausage? No eggs? He asked, surprised. His sister was the only person he knew who could eat more sausage than he could. No. She frowned, blue eyes clouding. It's funny, but even the thought of eating meat is making me feel sick. She grabbed a scone and turned away before he could comment, and approached Joan, who was pouring coffee into a tall glass cup. Sophie's nostrils flared. Hawaiian Kona coffee, she asked. Joan's gray eyes blinked in surprise and she inclined her head. I'm impressed. Sophie grinned and shrugged. I worked in a coffee shop. I'd know the smell of Kona anywhere. I fell in love with it when we were in Hawaii, Joan said. She spoke English with the merest hint of an American accent. I keep it in for a special treat. I love the smell. I hate the taste. It's too bitter. Joan sipped a little more coffee. I'll bet you didn't come here to talk about coffee. Sophie shook her head. No, I didn't. I just... She stopped. She had just met this woman, yet she was about to ask her an incredibly personal question. Can I ask you something? She asked quiet, quickly. Anything, Joan said sincerely, and Sophie believed her. She took a deep breath and her words tumbled out in a rush. 
Skatthatch once told me that you were the last person to have a pure silver aura. And that and that's why yours reacted to mine, Jones said, wrapping both hands around the cups and staring at the girl over the rim. I do apologize. My aura overyielded yours. I could teach you how to prevent that from happening. She smiled, revealing straight white teeth. Though the chances of meeting another pure silver aura in your lifetime are incredibly slim. Sophie nibbled nervously on the blueberry scone. Please excuse me for asking, but are you really, really Joan of Arc? But THE Joan of Arc? Yes, I really am Jeanne de Arc. The woman gave a short bow. La Pulce, the Maid of Orléans, at your service. But I thought, I mean, I always read that you died. Joan dipped her head and smiled. Ah, Scat that rescued me. She reached out and touched Sophie's arm, and immediately flickering images of Scatthatch on a huge black horse, wearing white and jet armor and wielding two blazing swords danced behind her eyes. The shadow single-handedly fought her way through the huge crowd who had gathered to watch my execution. No one could stand against her. In the panic, chaos, and confusion, she snatched me right out from under the noses of my executioners. The images flashed in Sophie's head. Joan, wearing ragged and scorched clothing, clinging to Skatatch as the warrior maneuvered her armored black horse through the panicking crowd, blazing swords in either hand clearing their path. Of course, everyone had to say they saw Joan die, Scatty said, joining them, carefully slicing a pineapple into neat chunks with a curved knife. No one, neither English nor French, was going to admit that the Maid of Orléans had been snatched out from under the noses of perhaps 500 heavenly armored knights rescued by a single female warrior. Joan reached out and took a cube of pineapple from Skatatch's fingers and popped it in her mouth. Skatty took me to Nicholas and Penele, she said. They gave me shelter, looked after me. I've been injured in the escape and was weakened for months of captivity. But despite Nicholas's best attention, I would have died if it had not been for Skatty. She reached over and squeezed her friend's hand again, not seeming to notice the tears on her cheeks. Joan had lost a lot of blood, Skatatch said. No matter what Nicholas or Penele did, she is not getting any better. So Nicholas performed one of the first ever blood transfusions. Uh, whose blood? Sophie started to ask until she suddenly realized she knew the answer. Your blood? Skatatch's vampire blood saved me and kept me alive too, made me immortal. Joan grinned. Sophie noted that her teeth were normal, not pointed like Scatty's. Luckily, it has none of the vampire side effects, though I am a vegetarian, she added. It happened for the last few centuries. And you're married, Skatatch said accusingly. When did that happen, and how? And what was it I was invited? She demanded all in one breath. Oh, we got married four years ago on Sunset Beach in Hawaii. At sunset, of course. We looked everywhere for you when we decided. Joan said quickly. I really wanted you there. I wanted you to be my maid of honor. Skatatch's green eyes narrowed, remembering. Four years ago, I think I was in Nepal chasing down a rogue Nigud, an abominable snowman, she added, seeing Sophie and Joan's blank looks. We had no way of contacting you. Your cell wasn't working and emails bounced back saying your inbox was full. Joan caught Skatatch's hand. Come, I have photos to show you. The woman turned back to Sophie. You should eat now. You need to replace the energy you've burned up. Drink plenty of liquids, water, fruit juices, but no caffeine. No tea, no coffee, nothing that's going to keep you awake. Once you've eaten, Francis will show you to your rooms where you can shower and eat. She slowly looked Sophie up and down. I'll get you some clothes. You're about my size, and then we'll talk later about your aura. Joan held up her left hand and spread her fingers. An articulated metal glove sparkled into existence over her flesh. I'll show you how to control it, how to shape it, make it into anything you wish. The glove turned into a metal raptor's claw, complete with curved talons before it faded back to Joan's tanned flesh. Only her fingernails remained silver. She leaned in and kissed Sophie quickly on each cheek. But first you must rest. Now, she said, looking at Skatthatch, let me show you those photos. The two women hurried from the kitchen, and Sophie made her way out back out the long room to where St. Germain was talking earnestly to her brother. Josh handed her a plate piled high with fruit and bread. His own plate was heaped with eggs and sausages. Sophie felt her stomach object at the sight and she forced herself to look away. She nibbled on the fruit, listening to the conversation. No, I'm human. I just can't awaken your powers, St. Germain was saying as she joined him. For that, you need an elder, or one of the handful of next generation who could do it. He smiled, showing his misshapen teeth. Don't worry, Nicholas will find someone to awaken you. 
Is there anyone here in Paris who could do it? Saint Germain took a moment to consider. Machiavelli would know someone, I'm sure. He knows everything, but I don't. He turned to Sophie, bowing slightly. I understand you were lucky enough to be awakened by the legendary Hecate, and then trained in the magic of air by my old teacher, the Witch of Endor. He shook his head. How is the old witch? She never liked me, he added. Still doesn't, Sophie said quickly, then blushed. I'm sorry, I don't know why I said that. The Count laughed. <laughs> oh, Sophie, you didn't say it. Well, not really. The witch did. It's going to take some time for you to sort through her memories. I got a call from her this morning. She told me how she imbued you not only with the magic of air, but her entire body of knowledge. The mummy technique hasn't been used in living memory. It's incredibly dangerous. Sophie glanced quickly at her brother. He was watching St. Germain carefully, listening to every word. She noted the tension in his neck and jaw from how he was squeezing his mouth shut. You should have rested for at least 24 hours to allow your conscious and subconscious time to sort through the sudden influx of alien memories, thoughts, and ideas. There wasn't time, Sophie muttered. Well, there is now. Eat up, then I'll show you to your rooms. Sleep as long as you like. You're completely safe. No one even knows you're here.